Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CTS uh, noon lecture. My name is Reginald Jackson, and I'm pleased to welcome you all here today. Uh, I am director of the Center for Japanese Studies here and also associate professor of uh, pre-modern Japanese literature and performance here at the University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor. So today, uh, we're honored and very pleased to have with us uh, Harry, Professor Harry Hertunian in conversation. Uh, before um, I begin uh, and get into the conversation, though, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, please join us next week for Okinawan Independence and Autonomy Debates in the 1980s, which will be given by our current CGS postdoctoral fellow, Ryan Masaaki Yokota, uh, who's here at the Center for Japanese Studies and teaching a course as well on Japanese and the other. Uh, Japan and the other this, this semester. We look forward to seeing you next week at uh, noon. This will be held in person in 110 Wiser Hall, uh, as well as on Zoom, so feel free to register for that as well. Uh, also, um, I would like to encourage you um, to check out our CTS events page um, on various social media for other CTS lectures that are scheduled for fall of 2022. I'd also like to, for the sake of housekeeping, mention that I'd like to have you be aware of the fact that since this is a webinar, um, we're going to begin this shortly, but viewer cameras, microphones, uh, have also, and chat have all been disabled for this webinar. So we'd like to ask that if you have questions during the Q&A function, uh, during the Q&A portion of this lecture, please uh, do that uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can submit questions throughout the lecture, um, and then we'll uh, answer as many of those as we can afterwards. Also, um, our guest, uh, Professor Harry Chaney, has also asked if uh, people don't mind to keep your questions succinct uh, so that it's easier to, to understand them and to follow them and uh, respond to as many of those as efficiently as possible. Also, um, be aware that for folks um, concerned about accessibility, that you'll also have the uh, opportunity uh, at the bottom of the screen to click on the CC or the closed captioning function as well uh, to follow along uh, if that's easier for you. Uh, beyond that, I also want to mention, for those of you not aware of that, uh, that uh, this is our 75th year, our anniversary year, uh, and we have a range of events that are planned uh, and will be occurring. This is um, perhaps one of the most important as a kind of kick-off kick -off event for our new lecture series. Um, but we also have lots of programming, including uh, film series, uh, live Vinci event, uh, alumni panels, um, panels with activists uh, in the Japanese American community. All of these things are coming up, so please stay tuned. And we really do encourage you to take part in as many of these as you're able to. And with that, then, I would like to move to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, the estimable um, Professor Harry Haratinian. It is really with great pleasure that I introduce Harry to you today. And I want to start by saying that uh, when discussing with colleagues who to invite to be part of this anniversary uh, celebration, uh, particularly folks like Mark Stonis and Chris Hill, um, uh, Harry's name was at the very top of that list for all kinds of reasons, um, partially because he is uh, um, an alum of our program. Um, he got his PhD here in 1958 uh, in math and history. Uh, but beyond that, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Harry remains a towering figure uh, in the field of Japanese studies, um, intellectual history, modern history more broadly. Uh, if I were to mention even a fraction of Harry's accomplishments and contributions to the field of intellectual history, Asian studies, Japanese studies, we'd be here all day and easily exhaust all our time for conversation. Therefore, I'll have to be uh, somewhat brief, but I want to emphasize that um, uh, Harry has exerted an incredible and singular influence, I think, on, on these fields uh, for decades and continues still to contribute, to write, to think, uh, and to challenge state notions of what Japan is and what Japanese studies could and could be. As I mentioned, he is a graduate of U of M, um, but he's had a distinguished career. Um, he's currently uh, the Max uh, Polevsky Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Chicago and Professor Emeritus of East Asian Studies at New York University. He's also currently the adjunct senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University. I think it's fair to say that um, he's brought the study of Japanese intellectual history in a dialogue with the concerns of scholars of modernity around the world and has written on subjects as diverse as samurai activism, early modern nativism, 
and 20th century modernism. Professor Harakuni is the author of multiple books, several of which have reshaped the discipline of Japanese history and invigorated the field of Asian studies more broadly. Um, he is, to put it mildly, an intellectual force to be reckoned with across eras and regions. Um, one of the things that I've appreciated about Harry's work um, and books like Overcome by Modernity, History, Culture, and Community in Interwar Japan, um, and Marx After Marx, History and Time and the Expansion of Capital in 2015, uh, are the ways that he um, constantly puts into dialogue um, Japanese interests and culture um, with the broader context. Um, his current research interests um, include the repetition uh, and the expansion of fascism in Japan, and he's trying to question the status of the remnant and uh, questions of anachrony in philosophical discourse in pre-war Japan as well. Beyond uh, his work on Japanese history and intellectual history, particularly as it relates to Marxist um, culture and thought, um, Harry has more recently uh, taken up the task of thinking about uh, the Armenian genocide and his writing uh, more explicitly. The recent publication of the book, um, The Unspoken is Heritage, The Armenian Genocide and Its Unaccounted Lives. And we'll talk a bit about that work in relation to his broader work on Japan a bit today. Uh, I first encountered Professor Heritunian's work in graduate school, and I found it both difficult and invigorating. Um, always valuable and instructive, I think, has been uh, Professor Heritunian's refusal uh, to fall into the orientalizing trap of highlighting Japan's oddness or default to a facile exceptionalism that was common, particularly in the 70s and 80s. Rather, he sought to situate Japan within broader capitalist, philosophical, and geopolitical contexts and emphasize not simple hierarchy but coexistent uneven temporalities often overlooked within a late capitalist regime. Especially generative for my own research um, has been Professor Hurtunian's investigation of how not only the past, but also time itself is contextualized and leveraged within nativist or cultural nationalist ideology. That he traces these trains transnationally and always with an emphatic eye towards the nature of people's everyday lives has been a hallmark of his work and his more recent forays into memoir in Armenian history especially. Professor Harakunian uh, has garnered uh, numerous awards over the course of his, uh, his long career, um, he, including um, being um, uh, honored in 2003 with admission to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, before that, he was also uh, awarded for his pedagogical work, uh, winning the Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching from the University of Chicago. He's um, been a distinguished lecturer for the Association of Asian Studies, um, been invited on numerous occasions to participate in the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University and has won numerous grants and awards um, over the course of his career. He is currently working on a, a monograph entitled Archaism and Actuality, Historical Form, Time, and Fascism in Modern Japan, which is forthcoming on Duke University Press and has edited a series on Modern Japan um, on Duke University Press. Uh, for the past um, couple of decades as well, ushering in all kinds of exciting new research uh, on Japan um, and modern Asia in a transnational frame. Um, there's more to say about the incredible work uh, Harry has done, not just as uh, a writer and intellectual, but also as a teacher, as someone who has challenged, uh, I think, both uh, up front on stage, but also behind the scenes uh, in terms of organizing to expand what we think of um, Jap what Japanese studies is and could be, and for that, um, I'm personally very grateful, and I think we all should be. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to move into the conversation and like to ask all of you to join me in welcoming Professor Harry Heritunian. So, thank you so much, Harry, for, for being with us today. We're so excited to have you and to, to talk with you about um, some of the concerns that have motivated your writings, um, some of what you're saying is now, how it's evolved. Um, uh, how glad you were to, to leave Michigan and move on to do other things. Uh, all that stuff. So, uh, so with that said, um, uh, first of all, I'm mean, just going to ask, um, how do you identify and, and where would you call home? Uh, thanks for asking me, uh, Reggie, uh, in the first place. This is the first time I, not the first time I've been in that. Mm -hmm. Uh, back in Ann Arbor, I'm not really back in Ann Arbor, but sorry, speaking in Ann Arbor in de many decades. I did speak there some years ago. Um, I can't remember when. My home is Detroit. 
uh, I mean, I, if that's the, if, I mean, if it's just it's strictly a literal question, I mean, I came from Detroit. Actually, I came from from an enclave, an industrial enclave within Detroit called Highland Park. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, uh, which is still there, I think. Uh, but I haven't been back to Detroit in seven years. Ago. And, uh, and it was a it was a good place to grow up. I found it was a good. I mean, it kind of it sensitized me to American cities, in which uh, I, I like living in, except. Uh, in my dotage where I'm up here in the semi wilderness and so it's beautiful. Uh, but nevertheless, Detroit. Great. No, thank you for that. And I think that um one of the the, the things that I wanna have us think about a little bit today is is you know, this question of of uh one way to understand one of the themes of the work is kind of questioning these kind of origins, questioning kind of how people uh, think of the ethnos or ethnicity uh, kind of attached to that or detached from that and the kinds of whether that's in fascistic ways, um, or or even in what we think of now as kind of in the politics ways around kind of race, class, ethnicity, region, and so forth, and and how that's um, you know been in the background, I think, in some ways of some of your work, but but I think particularly with some of your more recent work has come to the fore. So um, I want to say to maybe the people who are less familiar with um, what we're doing here today is that you know part of our goal, as I see it, over the course of this year, is really to think about the formation and the legacy of CDS. Uh, as linked to the development of Japanese studies, um, and this involves some, cele some celebratory commemorative work, uh, but it's also going to involve, I think, some more difficult and potentially destabilizing critical labor of working through the question of legacy and its residues, which I think is um, one of the reasons I'm excited to have you here. So, I mean, I want to make sure that we can resist the urge to overlook aspects of our collective inheritance um, uh, and maybe to challenge a purely laudatory narrative. So. You know, I'm really interested in the time before you set Japanese studies or history as your career path, first of all. Um, and, you know, I think kind of trying to discuss your intellectual, social, and political formation before you decided to become a historian of, of modern Japan, um, kind of prehistory of your professional endeavors, I think, is, is one of the places I want to start. So, you know, along these lines, what were you reading in high school and college? I mean, I, I know that later on you got a PhD in history, but... But what, what ideas or thinkers, artists, musicians did you find most compelling and, and why? I wasn't much of a reader <laughs> in, in, in my, uh, my uh, prehistory. Uh, uh, um, in high school, I'm reading, you know, I mean, I, I still remember, um, I, I, I think one of the first really serious novels that I've ever I really encountered was... Uh, uh, Tale of Two Cities, uh, Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, which is interesting because it it, 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 it was my first really encounter with, with not just simply the idea of revolution, but, you know, an attempt, in other words, to kind of, to, to kind of work through, obviously, the French Revolution. But apart from that, I mean, I, I was a really unexceptional child. I mean, basically, I came from, uh, I'm, uh, totally, I mean, I, my only real interest, I'll tell you what my interests were, was I, I like, you know, I like reading about sports, uh, and I, I thought maybe I might try, my son, you know, I mean, it's one of his childhood fantasies is, is to become a sports writer. And that, that dissipated quickly, uh, and, uh, um, my, my high school training was largely in vocational training, I mean, basic, I mean, that's what they did with, I was in a school which was filled with essentially the children of migrant workers, factory workers, basically factory workers. You know, I didn't live too far from the Ford plant, you know, the kind of classic, you know, one of the first major Ford assembly plants in, in Highland Park. And, uh, you know, our kind of destiny was already worked out for, for at least for many of us. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, it was only actually uh, uh, by accident that, that, that I ended up in, in going to a, a junior college, which was attached, or what they call community colleges now, I suppose, that was attached to the high school, and it was free. And this is really important, I think, at least for me and my generation, I mean, of, 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 that, that public schools, 
Wayne was almost free. I mean, I, I still remember all I ever paid was, was something like 52 bucks uh, for at Wayne. And Wayne stayed for athletic fees, but they had no athletics there. You know, I was, it was, you know, I was, it was, that was in whatever the place was about. And then, yeah, the, 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 the uh, uh, I was able to get into the, the junior college largely because I was a resident of Highland Park. I don't think it was any, it certainly wasn't that on the basis of my high school record. And, uh, and from there, uh, I mean, it was, it was, it was a good. It was it was a good beginning. I thought uh, as I look back at it, because it, there's where I began to do a lot of reading. You know, I mean, uh, largely the kind of reading that were assigned to to courses. Uh, you know, like history. I, I began to read. You know, a lot of uh, discursive texts. You know, in relationship to the course. Uh, so when I first began. I first read the, uh, some texts by Nietzsche. Um, beyond good and evil, I still I didn't I didn't understand all of it at the time, obviously, but it was a beginning. And texts like that, and no more important, William James's you know, varieties of, of religious experience, I think, still a great work, um, and I was extraordinarily readable. Great journalists like Lincoln Stephens, for example. I don't know if they even read any longer uh, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, as well as a, a you know politically reactive uh, uh, journalist as well, and people like that. I also began to study uh, you know French uh, as the language of choice. I had had some some Spanish, minimal Spanish in in high school, but it it, it left me really rapidly. So, uh, but the French is very good. So. And I went to Wayne. And Wayne was, of course, the, Wayne was the uh, the great moment. I mean, I, I have to say that for Wayne was the one place that, and I still feel this way, that I, I felt that I really belonged. And a lot of it had to do with just the incredible mix of students there, uh, returning veterans to the war, the GI Bill, uh, uh, you know, diverse ethnicities, African Americans, you name it, you know, it was, it was just, and there was, uh, it was, it was, it was a place, you know, there were, where you could kind of sense a shared equality in the sense that, you know, you know, you don't any longer, you know, I mean, having taught most of my life in, in private universities, I mean, I find that, you know, that's not a, that's, that's, that's just not an experience people have, actually. Yeah. And, you know, there, I mean, I, I, I encountered, uh, I mean, I encountered one, probably the greatest teacher I've ever, I've ever, uh, uh, experienced. This is a historian by the name of William Boffinbrook. My old friend and, uh, uh, an old former roommate and in Ann Arbor, his wife, has reason wrote, wrote, before he died, wrote, wrote recently, uh, uh, an encoding, uh, to Boffinbrook. We, we were all, and Bernie Silverman, my, one of my closest friends, and of course, went into Japanese studies with me and at Michigan, was also a student. And he was just an extraordinary historian. I mean, uh, I mean, I never, and, and, and he showed us, in other words, how to think about the relationship, the dialectical relationship between ideas, values, and even dreams, people. I mean, he was not, he was not, he was, he was not a Marxist in the classic sense. I mean, because he really didn't believe that things actually interacted with each other, but he thought that, that, you know, that those, those expressions of consciousness, especially, as, uh, and did. And that was the beginning, you know, and, and his courses were, they were not just, they were not, they were not just filled with just, just brilliant insights and, 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 uh, aperçu of, uh, of writers, thinkers, activists. But he also, you know, they were, they were filled with, Suggestions of books to read. I was there that I first read Max Weber for me. I was read actually there that I first started reading Marx, you know, the earlier stuff of Marx. But, you know, just a whole range of stuff depending upon the nature of the course. And he taught everything from kind of medieval, intellectual, and kind of cultural history all the way up through uh, 19th and 20th century nationalisms. I mean, these are different courses, of course. And with each one of these courses, a reading list that was just is still relevant. In any case, that was that was the 
and they had, that was what that was the high point of that experience. I had a lot of good teachers. I even I also had a really good teacher and uh, that taught Far Eastern history. This is uh, Frank Mayer Oaks, who uh, um, who was actually a specialist on Japan um, and had been. Uh, one of those language uh, officers, I think, in the Navy, you know, and, and did work in the occupation for a while before he came back to take his PhD in Chicago. So I guess I guess that was, you know, the uh, it was that it was that particular kind of environment, you know, uh, uh, that uh, you know that was exciting. I mean, you never wanted to be that basically. Yeah. In many ways. All the years since, it's been an attempt to try to kind of recover that. You know, you feel like, you know, having left it, you lost it. But, you know, yeah, for sure. It's always this attempt to recover that moment, which is most impossible. Yeah, no. Well, and that's super interesting. Thank you for, for that. And I, I mean, I have lots of, you have a bunch of questions that you know, but, but this is, I'm really compelled by, um, you know, your, I mean, the fondness with which you're narrating this, this kind of intellectual encounter and, and you know. It was amazing. Well, I didn't know anything, you know. I, mean, right. I, was, like, I was like a blank, you said, you know, I was a blank space. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds like, I mean, to that point, I mean, there's a couple of things that stand out, and I think that, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about, you know, um, corporate multiculturalism and, you know, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that are, are hollow, but you know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of Japanese studies for some time is it's kind of questions of what we might call now kind of diversity and whether I mean class class among these things, but what are part of the picture you're painting, I mean, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be overlooked is like what it means to have been able to, to have this humanistic education, really rigorous humanistic education for fifty two dollars. You know, like I mean like that like the exposure. I mean like the fact of being able to have that um uh, and to be exposed to folks who it sounds like um, um, this particular history professor of yours was was great, partly because of his range, but I, I imagine too the pedagogically, um, you know, treating you guys like you deserve to <laughs> to, to have you know, thoughts of your own and, and to be able to branch out. Right. And, and, it, and it wasn't like a, you know, one of the things that you've, you've written about, particularly I think about the work you've done with, with, with Masami Yoshi and learning places and so forth is, you know, the kind of um, the rush to professionalization and the narrowing that goes on with that, which seems in some ways antithetical to the much broader, much more uh, expansive kind of humanistic education. And so hearing about this in relation to some of the work that you were doing in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, um, it's, it, you know, you're not talking as much about the Wayne State experience in that context, but it's interesting to hear, as you mentioned, this kind of desire to recover some of some of the spirit of that moment it's, it's fascinating to me so and i think for any graduate students who are listening or undergraduates for that matter um you kind of understand the value of that uh, as opposed to just trying to kind of check a box and get an a you know easier said than done but i want to i want to move a little bit in here just to kind of to then you mentioned you kind of as a pivot that you had a professor in um, frank Meyer oaks um uh, who's working on japan and who was part of that that initial uh, interwar, post-war uh, generation of, of Japanologists, um, to use the term that, that you, you don't like to use, but I'm assuming it's more in that vein. Um, so what led you to Japanese studies? Um, and, you know, it sounds like, I was going to ask what drew you to history as a discipline, but it sounds like this particular professor, the fact that the folks who were giving you the most intellectual stimulation were, were you know, historians, but, but I was wondering if there were things methodologically or politically or thematically that that drew you in, and then and then how did that kind of how did the pivot happen to Japanese studies specifically? Well, he he was uh, you know I mean he was he was all really encouraging. I mean he and he actually it's interesting to look back upon it. Frank Frank had sent an awful lot uh, and, and a lot of students. I mean you know into essentially into Japanese, some in Chinese studies. I mean uh, uh, as well. Um, and he was a different kind of teacher than, say, Rosenberg, because he had, he had his own uh, talents and, and, and excellences. Uh, I was actually interested in China. I mean, he was, he, he taught, uh, you know, these, one of these kind of omnibus courses. And so, and I was really much more interested in China at the time, uh, and, uh, 
But I'm, and to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't really want to go into A station studies at all. I mean, my 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 real desire was to go. I wanted I wanted if I I, I thought it might be if I could do it to go into a medieval history, basically I mean, European medieval history, which of course has caught my my interest and. In, there was, uh, then it becomes a problem, you know, a problem of, there's a certain kind of materiality involved in all of your decisions. I mean, the places that really provided good training, or at least from what I can tell, were the places I simply couldn't afford, and they weren't handy, they weren't throwing out fellowships to, you know, people from Wayne State University. Um, uh, and then you could go, if you had them all and that money, you could go to one of these places. Like Yale, yeah, yeah, was one of those places that I thought, well, and I actually applied to them and was accepted, but I had to, you know, I had to go. I didn't have a train chair to take me out to New Haven since then. So, uh, you know, the, the next best thing was, you know, the University of Michigan and, and Japanese Studies, which had the Center for Japanese Studies. And that was what Mayor Oates, that's right, because he had some connection with some of the people that, you know, who, who were on the, uh, the faculty there, and, you know, especially Jack Hall, who was one of the historians, and, and Bob Ward, political scientist. I think he was close to Bob Ward. And anyway, he, he suggested to Silver and myself, especially. And Bernie was already, you know, uh, uh, committed, in other words, to going to Michigan and, and actually studying, uh, you know, Japanese history. Uh, I, I, you know, his, his role in this decision was really, in my decision, was really very, very important. Mm-hmm. He kind of talked me into it. We went. Uh, uh, and, fault. Uh, no, I don't blame him. No, we, you know, <laughs> we, you know, we suffered studying Japanese together for several years. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and I did do some stuff on China, especially Chinese the language, but um, actually, uh, the Jap- you know, I mean, it was, it was here that, 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 that I began to feel that loss that I spoke to you about, because I think that there was a, there's a very interesting kind of collision between the kind of education, the humanistic, you know, intellectual kind of education, and the political, by the way, I should say. I, I didn't mention that earlier, but Wayne was, it was a, it was a kind of political, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of training ground for a lot of students. I mean, I was involved in, you know, Student League for Industrial Democracy. I think it was an old Trotsky organization. I don't remember now. He was associated with the UAW-CIO as well. Um, but there is this, this conflict, it seems to me, or this collision between that kind of experience on the one hand and professionalization that's demanded, in other words, at the graduate level, especially if you're going on down yeah, it's certainly an MA. And I couldn't put them together, to be perfectly honest. I still have trouble putting them together, and I think that, I mean, they remain really as kind of separate entities. Yeah, almost hypothetical. I and I mean, it didn't work too well for me. I mean, to keep it that way, I mean, you know, in those years as a graduate student for me, basically, because I'm, they're always looking, you know, for, you know, for that moment, in other words, of, of intellectual excitement. Intellectual is always full of excitement, you know, which was mm-hmm. never, kind of never arrives, never comes. So. Yeah. Could, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's on that point. That I mean, makes sense? That makes total sense, yeah. I mean, what, so a couple of things that come to mind then. I mean, one, you know, I, I, I am, uh, I'm struck by, I mean, one of the things that's great, um, given, given the length of your career and the productivity of your career, is that uh, looking back to Wayne State and that kind of Detroit area, a connection to the United Auto Workers and that kind of um, kind of very kind of pro labor pro union kind of <laughs> also Trotskyist kind of uh, inclination. Yeah. You know, thinking about just I mean, I'm thinking not about the University of Michigan per se, but also about the broader kind of significance of of you know, Japanese investment in Michigan, particularly with you know auto. I mean, so oh, Michigan yeah. of of the 50s and 60s versus the Michigan of the 80s and 90s, and and um, you know, I'm thinking about this partially because this is the, the year, I mentioned this last week in, in my, my talk, but the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the murder of Vincent Chin, um, and and thinking about, like, how in the backdrop, I mean, that that, that history of, of uh, industrialization and then that so-called economic miracle of Japan, but all the things that are happening, you know, around that. So, 
that kind of political education or the, the kind of political potential that was there for Union Wayne State is much more diverse, much more, let's say, working class kind of environment and how, how you know, in some ways the story of Japanese studies is a story that, you know, of moving away from that, right, of moving away from those, that, I mean, certainly not just in terms of anti-communism and the Cold War period, but also I think at the level of institutions and so forth, like the type of training and the type of scenes that are deemed, um, you know, preferable, safe, um, you know, much more supportive of, say, friendship and, and as opposed to the, the kind of uh, the agonistic <laughs> realities of things. And so thinking about, say, circa 1960 versus, say, circa 1990, um, and I think about, you know, some of the work that you're doing later on in terms of critique of area studies is, is maybe one way to also explicitly, if not implicitly, critique some of the, the, the loss of of that more kind of overtly political kind of orientation, perhaps? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you raise that as a kind of a question. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, that tracks you. Yeah. I've always felt that, I mean, I, I, I understand, for example, uh, the necessity for, for what was, you know, what we call area studies at, in the beginning. I mean, it was a way of getting uh, the teaching of, of, of regions of the world that were not necessarily taught, languages and regions of the world that were not necessarily taught in a lot of universities. So getting it into the, essentially getting it into the academic procession, but, it, but, but I've always felt that it remained at the end of that academic, I mean, it's still in many instances, my experiences have been, and all of it is a kind of, you know, remains as a kind of afterlife, and of course it, it forced Eric, many of these programs to do, you know, to go out and get their own money, but I think that became, that became, you know, essentially their principal purpose in, in, in time. Uh, I mean, it was a form of, uh, and it became also the custodian of the kind of, uh, the professionalization that you get, in other words, with, uh, you know, professional organizations, so forth, like the AAAS, you know, I mean, sure. I can't help thinking that, you know, that, 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 you know, it was, I mean, it, and it was a problem for people in area studies. I mean, what, like, one of the things that area studies promised at the beginning was some form of comparability. Generally, you know, I mean, to integrate, in other words, you know, uh, um, regions, you know, in such a way so that you can really begin to lay in, in the groundwork and think about or think through the question, you know, of, of, of of how you might go about doing, a, you know, real com serious comparative work. That never really, uh, you know, materialized. Uh, and we, we know, I mean, there are reasons, there are good enough reasons why, you know, and, and you know, um, as I say, you know, the, and the people in area studies remain, you know, they're largely at the tail end of that, that, that academic procession. And, uh, you always had a sense that, that, you know, at least for a long time, I mean, I didn't have this problem that, that I didn't have this problem, I didn't have this sense when I taught in Chicago, which, which in itself is a, you know, is a much more unique experience given the whole nature of that university, you know, as well as I do. But certainly in many places that I, that I taught before, and even after, like NYU, it was, Asia, you know, East Asia, there is like an afterthought, you know, in, in the mind of administrators. I mean, basically, I mean, you know, uh, unless unless you can pay your own way, you know, it's not, you know, they can't do it. They can't help you, you know, basically. So uh, I think that that's what's happened to area studies. I mean, it's it's it has a kind of ghostly existence as far as I'm concerned. Oh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, which is sustained by these professional organizations, but basically it's ghostly. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. And I, mean, I think it's helpful to think, I mean, again, to kind of face out, um, you know, that is, is related to, I mean, you're, you're mentioning now in terms of thinking about the administrative aspect, the ways in which, you know, when one has to pay one's own way as a department or as a, as a field, you know, kind of what, you know, what the, let's say the stakes of the, the liabilities of that happen to be when, when you have to be tied to certain interests for the sake of, Making sure you know people have jobs, you know, lectures are, are fed and, and faculty are able to kind of teach and butts and seeds. So it kind of demands, in some ways, uh, that logic of, of neglect. Right? Also demands then a, a different kind of, um, you know, arguably safer and apolitical kind of, um, much more professionalized, um, less expansive kind of way of doing things. So um, along those lines, I, I guess I'd want to kind of pivot a little bit to ask. Um, 
about like how would you describe the stakes of producing research on Japan and you know kind of when you were first starting out and you talked about being a kind of blank slate and then effectively um, kind of when you're starting your your graduate training then um, you know with with Bernie Silverman uh, kind of uh, changing and being exposed to a much more professionalized, um, uh, you know, as, you know, Masao would say, you know, the kind of, not the, the kind of version of, of authority that you might have gotten in my state, but the kind of much more the expertise model of things, right? Um, yeah, they have to be with but, it you know. with expertise, and of course, you know, the stakes were first just defined by the necessity of, of learning a difficult language, I mean, and, 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 your, and the capacity to use it, I mean, that. You know, that essentially took up most of my life. Look back at it now, that took up a lot of time, I'm sure. You must have had the same experience. <laughs> and it was often well and well taught. I mean, you know, I, I, one of the best examples I give you is that Bernie and I went into, we were put into second year Japanese because they didn't, when we went to Ann Arbor, you know, in our first year, because they were not teaching first year. And, you know, you really pay a high price for that, you know. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know a kind of from a, you know, anything, you know, much less. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think that the uh, the stakes, and I think it's an extraordinary thing, uh, is as everything, uh, I had the feeling when I was there that it had, there were a number of things that were being done by those experts. One was, of course, to to enshrine the, uh, the American occupation. Many of them were, of course, old occupationaires, and this, this is a part of their experience as well as their formation. The other thing is, it was, it seems to be, it was to lessen, to lessen in many ways the, uh, the experience or the, of the war, ep or the episode of the war itself. I mean, uh, and I think that actually the whole problem of developing a program called the modernization of Japan, which Starts pretty early, late 1950s, you know, uh, and, and you know, but 60s, I think the 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 real takeoff date because they had this 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 initial conference at in Hakone. I think that that was designed. That whole project was in many ways designed to diminish uh, the uh, you know the memory of the war, the experiences of the war. Now, you know, when you, you kind of compare that, you see, with what Japanese themselves were doing in terms of, you know, the wartime experience and memory and so forth and so on. And, you know, they were just, you know, worlds apart, actually. But I do believe that that was the... And it was a kind of irony operating here because all of these people that were... The bulk of these people that were involved were all involved in the war itself, you see. I mean, you know, I mean, language or you know, translators, interpreters, what have you, uh, combat. And uh, that, you know, that it was a war that in many ways created Japanese studies, but on the other hand, there was an attempt to kind of, uh, to efface the memory of the very war, the very conditions, in other words, that made for jet production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that was the stakes yeah. of mine, I mean, by the way. I mean, now again, I mean, right. I mean, I wonder about, you know, you know, I mean, my stakes had more to do with, you know, not only just studying history, and basically I came to Japan to, stu and to Japanese studies. I was not interested in, in as such and what they were doing, I mean, the whole Okayama project, you know, uh, Village Japan, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, it was, an, I guess it's an important project, but it was, you know, it, it was, it was, it was beyond, it was, it was not the kind of thing that I, I had, I had in mind as far as my own particular work was concerned. And sure. so, you know, you end up, you know, trying to, to do work along those lines. And for example, I mean, I, I actually wanted to write a dissertation on, you know, one of these Japanese uh, activists in the late Edo period, like Yoshida Shonen, but I kind of got scotched, and I ended up writing about, you know, Shizoku, uh, Bizenhan Shizoku in the 1870s and 80s, what happened to these guys, these former samurai, you know, and none of them, none of them could make a living in, 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 in a capitalist world, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, and uh, once once I did that study, I I, I never went back. I, I really never went back to that kind of that kind of. Uh, 
history. So if the stakes, mm-hmm. for many of the stakes were, you know, ultimately defined in terms of precisely the kinds of thinking that Japanese were doing at certain moments in their, in their history. Mm-hmm. And what kinds of political dimensions and, I don't know, com- consequences they may have had. Yeah, no, I think that, that makes a lot of sense, and it's, it's, I really appreciate, um, yeah, you're, as always, I appreciate your candor, and, and um, you know, I, I, it's in retrospect, you know, given all that you've done, I think it's, you know, I'm certainly not just amused, but also heartened, and I, I, I hope that some of the students uh, are, are, are too, that this is, this is a fluke in many ways, like there's, there's a way that, there, that there's, you know, part of what you're describing are the, are the, the kind of, um, the the infrastructural considerations that are kind of shaping you know kind of what you're able to study what what seems um, what you're pushing against even if it's not like a a very kind of frontal confrontational thing but I, I think about even I don't know why the first project was 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 Scotch but like the fact of I shot I, I mean, oh okay okay no no and nobody I mean I just never thought but I mean I can't say that. I was, you know, there was a great encouragement, or, you know, in those days, you know, people, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I got a couple of articles on it, and actually went on to something else, basically. Yeah, yeah, I think um, that's super interesting, and I, I'm, I'm, um, I mean, thinking more about, I mean, your, your interest in remnants and, and the kind of the ghastly qualities, right? This kind of dinosaurs, the remnants of the ghosts, and, <laughs> and you know, but that, but this, but I think it's, it's really. Um, Sometimes I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but the, the horse is so interesting that you want to you want to beat it some more. That like this this notion of of what's going on in that moment is this kind of whitewashing that you're talking about in terms of the war and the the deep personal I mean, investment that these various teachers of yours or the kind of professionals that are in this moment are 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 trying to efface as as the constitutive like the engine of a certain version of Japanese studies that that has to be kind of um, Unacknowledged, right? and has to be uh, because to, to to bring that to light would also be to right kind of you know cast doubt on the integrity or the you know you know validity of this of this enterprise, and so like the you know the trauma that that produces or, or the kind of the weirdness that I think some of us uh, feel in, in this field is exactly kind of a result of, it, of that. It's, it's exactly. kind of like the kind of the gaslighting <laughs> of, of the exceptionalism is also very much uh, about the narcissism. It's always been there, yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, but, but to have, you know, you kind of talk about like being in the midst of that as opposed to, you know, and reading um, Ed Seidensticker's memoirs um, recently and, and him talking about Michigan in the in the, the 60s and 70s um, and translating Genji in that context. And it's, yeah, it's really it's fascinating to to think about. Um, we'll get back to this in different ways, but effectively, the uh, one way to think about it is the whitewashing you're talking about in terms of memories of World War II, but also just kind of institutionalization of a certain form of whiteness or white masculinity as as part of that formation and how that how that. I mean, given what you said thus far, I'd like to believe that part of your own um, you know, kind of formation through Wayne State, <laughs> you know, and, and through this kind of space to kind of have those juxtaposed in the same, you know, miles away from like one another, but juxtaposed in the last, you know, between what's going on in Wayne State and what's going on in Michigan in terms of philosophies, in terms of pedagogies and so forth, you know, I like to believe, that, you know, kind of helps to ground a certain critical sensibility about it. Like something is, you know, something's off um, that then ends up being kind of working its way into the scholarship later on. You know, well, sure. I, I, I think that certainly at at one mm-hmm. level that there, mm-hmm. there was there was a there was a real difference. I think Wayne was basically a teaching institution. I mean, mm-hmm. many of the people that that that, that I worked with were not necessarily you know mm-hmm. active scholars. I mean, they write mm-hmm. some stuff. And whereas at Michigan, certainly in the graduates, you know, was was highly professionalized and and was seen in, you know as a as a research institution, basically, where you learn how to, you know, pick up a trade, you know, a scholarly trade, basically. Well, I think along those lines, and it, 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 I think I want to return to the, I mean, partially because I'm thinking about, you know, making this accessible to folks who, to some people, you know, who join us today, um, who are, um, you know, kind of colleagues and kind the of scholars in their own right and who are, you know, followed your work for, for years. And there's also folks who are undergraduates and graduate students who are, 
just kind of getting um, acclimated to this um, strange, weird place we call, I mean, not just Michigan, the University of Michigan, but, um, but also Japanese studies. And so I wonder if you could say a bit about, um, like, your philosophy of teaching or training graduate students. I mean, like, when, so when you kind of transitioned from, from, you know, writing a dissertation and then moving into, you know, becoming a professor, um, was, were there certain principles or methods that you were trying to emphasize? And could you talk a little bit potentially about kind of how your approach might have evolved over the years in different institutional settings and political contexts? And well, I think about your, your, you know, your work with, with Tetsunajita and Masami Yoshi in this way, too. You know? Well, uh, yeah, I, before then, though, I mean, I, I taught largely at, uh, you know, undergraduate places like Penn State for a while. And then the University of Rochester, which for me was was a kind of important uh, Education in my formation. I mean, uh, I was in a really smart history department. There are a lot of smart people at Rochester in those years. I mean, uh, you know, people like Hayden, for example, and then later on, historians like uh, Genovese. I mean, uh, Norman O. Brown was perhaps the most original thinker that I've come, you know, ever in the common. I mean, people like that. Um, and you learn, you learn how to, you know, especially from people like, you know, I used to sit in on Brown's you know, of course, I'm all myth. And uh, you learn you learn what a really good teaching is, you know, basically. I mean, I already had a, a kind of template, you know, that does a result of my own experience. But I was teaching mostly undergraduates uh, at, at, uh, at, at Rochester. I didn't, I didn't have any really... I had only actually, you know, one really good graduate student. That was Ari Stierle, who was at worked in Chinese history. You must know it in that name. Uh, he was amazing, you know. I mean, you know, he came, he came, he came to Rochester on a Fulbright in, in engineering, and he, he just dropped that and said, "I want to, I want to study Chinese history." I said, "I'm not a Chinese historian." I said, "But I can help you, basically." No, he was just amazing. Uh, at Chicago, uh, my uh, the, what we did, you know, it, it was it, Tess and I taught a seminar in Japanese history. For 25 years, I mean, basically uh, every year, and how we taught it was, we had the uh, we thought we we had we, we we both of us had recognized the importance in other words of certain kinds of theoretical and meta theoretical writings that might be relevant to in other words any kind of historical practice. And so we always, it was not always the same kinds of texts, but we, we always had, uh, students read and we would discuss these texts initially. You know, if it's a year seminar, you can do that. And out of this, in other words, this, then we would, we would, we would ask the students, in other words, to be, start thinking about their projects. And a lot of them wanted to really work on certain kinds of figures or texts, basically. And what we did was, we then when continued the reading of texts, every they would select some portion of a text that they might be working on in Japanese, basically. And we would all read it together, and that would become the basis of a, of a you know, a, a weekly discussion, which fed into ultimately the writing of the papers themselves, basically. And that's. That was the technique that we used, uh, you know, uh, through all that time. My own case, and beyond beyond that, I I organized. I didn't organize. I was I organized with. I mean, I read a number of graduate students uh, reading course that we met once a week for almost eight years, nine years, uh, uh, and there we just read solidly, you know, theoretical texts. I mean. That's you know, this is at Chicago, uh, and uh, you know, I, it was a, a you know, it was a kind of continuation of my own education. And part of what I'm saying is that, that everywhere I've gone, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I've written a lot of stuff. A lot of it's, uh, you know, she's probably sh I shouldn't have written, but nevertheless, uh, no, I'm I'm serious about that. You know, you kind of take stock of you know what you the stock that you you've assembled, but I, I, I've always felt that, and this is the one thing that, you know, you, know you, you learn along the way is that, you know, because a lot of academics don't learn it, I think. 
is that you know your education doesn't stop with a, you know a PhD and you you know you got you have to continue in some way or another words to to keep it going in other words and I you know that's basically what I've tried to do in you know, other words mm-hmm. right down to the present because I'm a, I'm still I'm participating in a, in a in a large reading group and largely filled with people from not just Columbia but even as far west as Seattle and South, North Carolina. So. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's. I mean, it's inspiring. And I think that. I mean, part of what I was. You know, I didn't know about those particular seminars. I mean, I've heard tell, and I know you know all of the you know really influential um, students that have come out of of you know that period and that that program. And and I, I really appreciate that part of what you're saying is that you're learning a lot from the students. Um, and you know, kind of giving the students space to pursue their own interests actually then also, you know, becomes part of the basis of your own kind of community, you know, um, education. And I think that uh, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. I think increasingly, right, I think part of part of the professionalization you know, um, entails this kind of really strict hierarchy as well that, that can shut that kind of exchange down. Right. Right? And so the idea yeah. of like really having a space that that flattens that out of it. I mean, of course, there's, there's people can get graded and so forth, but there is something about trying to cultivate, and, and you're talking about also team teaching, which I think is something that, that um, you know, some deans <laughs> see as a problem because, you know, when you can have two classes as opposed to kind of one person, it seems like a, you know, a waste of resources, but, like, yeah, but you know, if the resources is truly financial and not intellectual, then... then um, well, she kind of wanted to do that, yeah, yeah. at least when I was there. Mm-hmm. And, and, but it wasn't, you know, they were, you know, we weren't getting a free ride. I mean, in many cases, both both Tess and I uh, were taught, you know, uh, uh, tutorials as well, you know, with just individual students, I mean, you know, basically, you know, and, and whether it's one student or three students, I mean, it, it takes time, it takes time for preparation, for example. So uh, it was, it was, in, you know, it was, that was a, that was a central, I and mean, we, we were, we were also lucky. I mean, I mean, really lucky. We had really good students. I mean, that was, a, that was a, the heyday, it seems to me. I think, uh, uh, you know, developing uh, just numbers within Japanese-related studies, and, you know, Chicago was a place that, that drew good students like a magnet. You know, maybe students, some far better than we probably deserve that they, I mean, they were so, I mean, I had, some of them were really, really incredibly smart. I mean, you know, students like Alex Sakai and Bill Baker, I mean, they were just, you know, they were in a different register. Mm. But they were okay. all good, yeah. No, I think, I mean, I, that's, I mean, it's really great to, to hear and to kind of think about in terms of, you know, I'm always interested in, in how people are, are teaching and learning and, and what, you know, how people are building spaces that are conducive to that kind of really generative intellectual exchange. And so, you know, can continue to, to pick your brain a bit about how best to, to do that. But I want to um, have a, a little bit more time before we move to the Q&A. And so I, I wanted to maybe turn to think about, um, I mean, two things I want to make sure we get to. I mean, one is, is um mentioned this to you before, but, you know, in the epigraph to your 2019 book, Uneven Moments, Reflections on Japan's Modern History, which is effectively a collection of essays of, of yes. yours, um, but you have this great uh, this great quote from uh, C.L.R. James. It, it says, quote, there is no world for which I was fitted, least of all the one I was to enter. And so I, I wanted to ask, uh, um, you know, could you talk a little bit about the influence of C.L.R. James or, you know, black Marxism on your, on your thinking? Um, no, but also, you know, kind of how how these things kind of relate to some of the work that you're doing in, in um, you know, with it relates to Japan, for instance. I, I came to James rather late. I mean, part mm-hmm. of it because he was, you know, uh, more than anything else, I think, a, a superb social historian, and I was in James. I mean, but I did come to him. But I got, I really came through him kind of indirectly through uh, reading a, a good deal of Fanon. Franz Fanon was uh, Fanon, and then the M.A. Césaire. Césaire, uh, you know, both as an essayist and a poet. I mean, you know, the stuff is just unbelievably, you know, as you know. Uh, and ultimately, Stuart Hall, who uh, introduced to me among not only uh, 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 good, in other words, uh, 
So in order to have a government to protect you there, we, we introduced really the utility, I should suppose, or the applicable, a, applicability of, of Gramsci to historical practice. I mean, that's basically, and, uh, that quote you know, struck me. I mean, I mean, I you know, I went on to read a couple of things. I read, you know, uh, the, 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 the book on the, the Black Jack. Black Jack was really you know, <laughs> stands out as one of the great works of you know yeah. of our time. And, but I also read his uh, his world, you know, uh, uh, James's world. What is the world revolution? I don't know if you've ever taken a look at that. That's a kind of prescient work, you know, especially about. Written around an ethical law in 1937 to That quote uh, struck me uh, right to the core, largely, uh, and maybe for all the wrong reasons. I don't know, but I, 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 I thought it was speaking to me, and it, it was describing to me what my life had been like and, and is, in the sense that I came out of a situation I had already mentioned, you know, as essentially a vibrant situation. Um, my parents were from Anatolia, I mean, but I was, my sisters and I were born here in the United States. And, but I, 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 I saw, I, I, my earlier years, and I, I mean, it's not, it, that, that's what I meant was not so exceptional because there are an awful lot of, of my contemporaries that had the same experience, you know. Uh, we were all tigers. I mean, we were, you know, we were made to feel like outsiders, you know, public schools and notwithstanding, you know, I mean, we did, and that stays again, in a sense, you know, um, you grow up with that, and, and, and you remain an outsider. I mean, one of the things, and I think you may have mentioned this in, in your, in your, 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 uh, account, your, your inventory, your great inventory of questions, is that it does create the, the conditions or the circumstances in which, as an outsider, in other words, it's a, it's a, it's positionality, it provides, uh, the, uh, opportunity for certain kinds of criticism. I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean it's the only condition, but, but it certainly enables it in, in, in ways that, uh, you know, that we don't really often think about. And it stays with you, you see. And, that was really, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, that, that James, for example, you know, James, you know, had the same experience. I mean, you know, he tells us this, um, and, you know, he goes through the best, some of the best schools, you know, and he knows, but he's, he knows he's not part of it. He's never part of it. He did, you know, the kind of work that was done, and he went to well beyond it, but always it stayed with him, you know, that sense of being on the outside. If I can quote from, you know, as a kid, you know, one of the things, I mean, I, I, if I can quote from another really great writer, as far as I'm concerned, is Carolyn Steedman. I don't know if you've ever read her work on on her mother. I mean, it's really a kind of, what is it, a kind of a, it's an account of something like a, a, of a good woman. And Steedman says, I mean, she can, hers is about class, not so much, about, obviously, about, you know, ethnicity. But ethnicity, I mean, you know, one of the things people always, you know, make, you can't necessarily separate ethnicity, you know, uh, from, from class. And anyway, she, she tells us, in, a, in other words, that, that having been on the, on being on the outside, you know, in terms of, you know, the British class system, she says, we, we always wonder what, what they, those on the inside want a hand. And I thought, you know, but you never get it, basically, or most of us never get it. And even if you get it, it doesn't mean anything. Again. You're still not part of it. And I think that that's the, that's you know, that's what I saw in James with that quote. You see, I mean, uh, it allowed him to be the not both the the great historian. I mean, he was, a, you know, but also a, his great history is also a critique. That's how he. He dealt with precisely the very society that yeah. enabled him. The Daily Nation, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, it's really helpful and, and, and powerful just to think about. I mean, so we've gone from Henry James to C.L.R. James and, and thinking about, like, those are different types of, I mean, you know, that's it's a lot of, 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 it's, it's a lot of ground to cover, but, but, you know, that sense of, uh, um, that, that resonates for all kinds of reasons, but, you know, 
like you say, like what what that that status of being outside enables in terms of, of potential critique, or just I think about this now a lot, kind of reading more recently, and kind of more like queer studies work, and and like what a certain subjectivity doesn't demand, it doesn't kind of lock one into a certain way of seeing the world, but when one is forced to um, because of these material circumstances to to pay attention differently, to be attuned for the sake of you know safety, you know aspiration, you know to kind of with the American dream or some forth, and you, right. you're, you're, like, right. you, you figure that you, you get to, you pay attention to the mechanics of that, and you don't take as much for granted, and I think that there is something to be said for that, and maybe on that point, before we move to the q and I, I, you know, I have two things I want to mention, so one is, is um, I was really struck by, and I really enjoy uh, reading your, um, the Unspoken as Heritage book, and, and it seems, it seems like such, in some ways, a departure, I mean, stylistically, in some ways, some of the earlier work, so I'm not sure, you know, but but could you talk a little bit about the, the, the decision to turn to, to thinking about your parents' stories and, and trying to kind of do, um, uh, you know, it's remarkable for lots of different reasons, but um, the, the, the sense of needing to tell that story at this point in your life or in relation to some of your other work or or kind of um, where does the desire come to, to do that and, and how does, how does this, again, thinking of this question of stakes, like, that context, um, um, given all of the things that you've done up to this point, now, why now and and and, and why this? Well, it's a, it was overdue. I think it was late. I mean, uh, and, and maybe it was just a way of it, it. It was something that kind of grew with me. I I had, you know, I mean, I I, I had been uh, involved obviously as, as when I was younger. It, it, you know, I mean, in, uh, with groups and uh, with social relationships and uh, and organizations, but left uh, largely because I, you know, got I wrote some stuff that got me into trouble with, you know, uh, I, you know it had to do with music. I, I, you know, people who used to complain about it's in the book. It's a, they used to complain about at these social gatherings. The playing of music, Turkish music. And I said, it's not Turkish music. I said, it's only the language. And only the language is, is Turkish. And if you know, I said, those songs are usually sung in Armenian as well. So that didn't settle well with some of the elders. And I just felt that it was not worth doing it. Um, my father always wanted me to, you know, to, thought that I should have, should have done, you know, gone into something that I really knew. I mean, after all, I didn't speak English until I went to grade school. I spoke Armenian. I mean, even some churches in that time, those years. Uh, I, I, I felt that it was a kind of obligation in the end for a lot of reasons. And again, the stakes are this. I, I was a little, you know, it's a little tired. I mean, we don't need to have uh, genocides defined by the experience of one group. And that's basically what, 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 what the way it gets played out in American society. You know, nobody cares about, you know, uh, we don't talk about the Cambodians. We don't talk about the Rwandas that much, you know. We don't talk about the Armenians, you know. Mm-hmm. Really, that people is, is not nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and, and you can't, in the pantheon of, 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 of genocides, you can't, numbers don't mean anything, you know? I mean, you know, I mean, of course they're, I mean, that's what a genocide is. It's always an attempt, in other words, to destroy, in other words, a, a group, an ethnicity, you name it. And we've had these, you know, all, you know, we had it in our own history, for Christ's sake, you know? You know, there was Native Americans. We have, we had genocide among the African Americans. I mean, that's the way you think that, you know, I mean, there are different ways of killing people. And large groups of people. Anyway, I felt that 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 was one of the things that needed to be brought forth. I mean, you know, but it was also very personal. I mean, I really do think that that it destroyed. I mean, there are lives of the survivors. You don't talk about them, and that's that's really what that book is is really about. What it did to both my mother and my one hand, who who had an awful sad experience, and and my father who. None of them ever recovered from it. That's all. And basically, I felt that some form of tribute. They could have been something else. No, no. Thank you for explaining that. And, and 
it it um it feels that way, it reads that way, I mean as a kind of um certainly as a tribute, I mean as a way to kind of make peace to accept that that's even kind of impossible or something like that, but to, to do right by or honor um yeah. that, that, that memory um yeah. in a personal way. And and I wonder, you know, a little bit about this as as you know, all the things that are absolutely I mean, you know, constitutive of, of who we are as, as human beings, as scholars that, that never get said. Right, or never expressed, partially because of some of these things, right? I mean, I don't know if it's felt like, you know, pre-tenure, say, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that, right? you know, you're like, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Your, your, your last, your last suggests, <laughs> your last suggests that, that it's, it's, it's in fact would have been ludicrous to kind of, to do that kind of work, or to even be in that frame of mind at that certain, at that moment, but, but, you know, having done all these other things, to kind of come back in some ways to the beginning sounds, um, and I wonder about that, the kind of earned sense of, I don't know if it's freedom or or if there's just like the weight of the obligation, but, um, you know, I, I'm struck by, by um, you know, even at the level of style, I think it's, 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 it's of a different, you're not, you're not, you're not credentialing yourself, you're not, you know, you're not uh, armoring yourself against, you know, the guy I hope that. No, I'll no, it doesn't feel that way at all. Yeah. I'll tell you, right, sure, so very different. There yeah. was, there was, a, there's the other factor was, yeah. was thinking about it started because of that that started much earlier uh, about Masao when Masao, yeah. you know, and you know we wrote, yeah, you and mine and a number of other people yeah. you know, yeah. in his life, you yeah. know, which you know I always felt that you know uh, I mean he was really. And really important I mean, in my life. I mean, I, you know, it's just it's hard to, it's really hard to calculate how important it is. Mm -hmm. but his life is, you know, I mean, he, I always felt that here was a guy, you know, that never, never got the kind of recognition he should have had, both in the United States, but especially in Japan. In Japan, especially, yeah. 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 Well, I think, I mean, Oh, I'm sorry, but did you want to... No, 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 that's all I was just... Yeah. I just wanted to get that in because I think that... That's that part of the Thinking about his life. Yeah. You know, yeah. made yeah. reinforce that yeah, the, the sense of obligation yeah. to kind of... Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, I didn't... I mean, I didn't know Masao well, and he was very important to one of my mentors, you know, Hideki Richard Okada, and... It was, it was in uh, Richard's uh, doctoral... Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a savior, and, and that's a whole other story I've written about that, and you know, in, in that in that in that volume, the yeah. two volume. But you know, and Masao was you know brilliant and could be really difficult in all of these things. It's it was quite to me. Impossible. It's impossible. Right? I was trying to be diplomatic, but yeah. No, no, no. no. Some some would some some would say you know yeah exactly. I mean you know like kind of hell on hell on on wheels and earth, and and you know did a lot of damage uh, at the same time that he was. Good to people who were who were good to me, and so it's complicated. But I I, I would say that um, you know along those lines, maybe to kind of last thing before we turn to the the, the audience's questions is is um, yeah, I mean the sense of, of memorializing or you know it's not an encomium. Right? Phil Kasten we talked about who just mentioned that he translated I guess Karatani uh, Karatani's um, uh, kind of eulogy in some ways. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and so I'm thinking about that, but but you know, just uh, to close up here, you know, we're con in the midst of considering CGS's you know first 75 years, and you know, if we're not all kind of underwater or, or melting from from global warming and so forth, you know, if you were to imagine, um, you know, the next 75 years, I take this question from my lovely wife, um, she, but you know, what would you want to see or you know want to have folks avoid if you can even you know, if we were to imagine um, Japanese studies, um, you know, and maybe it's, you know, if you want to wish for its extinction, that's also fine. Um, we won't we won't lead with that as a reception later, but 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 uh, is there something that you know, looking back um, and thinking about your experience, but then also potentially, you know, what the future might hold, um, kind of lessons that seem important to carry forward. I think that I I don't know. It's hard to imagine uh, since I've. I've I've, I've, I've said such nasty things about area studies in the past anyway. I mean, uh, I mean, so you know where, you know, that I don't really believe in, in them as institutions, but I do believe, I mean, I haven't seen very much change. I, I mean, I'm afraid that, that there'll be a lessening of, 
of, of people going into these fields, especially the ones that are, you know, again, with difficult languages. They, I mean, why are you going to spend all this time, in other words, you know, learning a language that you never really learned, I mean, in one sense. Uh, but I would have hoped that people would follow their own agenda and that that area of studies, I mean, to, in some ways or another, I mean, I think that, you know, a good deal of area studies has been possibly replaced. I, I, I think people think that it, it's an, you know, it's a, a productive uh, of replacement with in, in, in cultural studies, but I don't think that, I mean, cultural studies is, you know, has had one desire, and that is to replace Marxism, basically, and it hasn't, it really hasn't succeeded. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it's ended up, you know, it's kind of reduced to various kinds of, you know, kind of, of what is it, identity studies, which really, I don't really feel goes very far, actually. And I think that, that, that it's got to get back in. I would think that area studies have to re-enter the world, basically, and to do what it should have done in its initial moments, you know, to to bring things together and to provide the the framework and other words for for really productive, you know, productive forms of comparability, basically, to make it to make it equivalent to mm -hmm. those more traditional disciplines if you want. I mean, to make it, let it stand on its own feet, you know. Let it, people should study Japan, China, you know, Russia, you name it, Africa. I mean, uh, you know, because they're they're important. It's not that not important because it's some sort of neo, set of neoliberal conceits these days. But they're, you know, they're important. And, you know, and, and bring to them their perspective. Don't try to reproduce the Japanese. I I remember just if I can just say one more. I mean, something mm -hmm. telling me that we have to we have to use, in other words, native methodologies. I find that I find that is really preposterous, preposterous and dangerous, basically. And of course, it really really grows out of the primacy of learning a language and mm -hmm. wanting to be. I never yeah. wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. be the native. Be the native. Uh, native. Never. I mean, I can't, and nobody can, you know. That's what area studies and others need to do. Great. Thank you so much for that. Well, with, with that, let's, let's transition to the questions from the audience. We have several here. Um, some are, um, and I appreciate that folks are trying to take seriously uh, Professor Harrodinian's request for more succinct questions. So, um, so. Uh, one, some of these are compliments. So uh, Heidi Gottfried says, wonderful to hear the prehistory of Wyoming State as a current professor here in Detroit. So that's just a, a compliment. So thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get all that. Oh, she said, it's wonderful to hear the prehistory of Wayne State as oh. a current professor here in Detroit. So she's just, um, just kind of interested in, in, in that. Um, but here's, here's a question from Aditya Kanan, uh, who says, hey, so what exact insight did your history teacher give you what can you remember that stood out? So is there something, it sounds like you were talking about the kind of breadth of, of, of experience and, and moving from, say, medieval Europe to the kind of present, but were there any I'll particular tell insight? I'll, yeah. I'll tell you what it did. Please, it introduced yeah. me to, it was my first really genuine, I'm going to talk about, about Baltimore. It was my first genuine encounter and experience with dialectical thinking. That's what it taught me. Great. Great. Thank you. And thank you for that question, Aditya. Um, so this is a question from Allison Alexi, um, who says, thank you for this incredible conversation. I wonder if you have any advice or suggestions for current students who might be feeling something like the whiplash you might have felt between Wayne State and Marvel. <laughs> I really appreciated your description of that moment of disorientation when you nevertheless were able to ground yourself and wonder if you could talk about that more, particularly for the benefit of students. Yeah. That's a difficult question to, to, to answer. I mean, it's a, it's a, I think an extraordinary, I'll tell you, it's an extraordinarily personal one. And, and a lot of the thoughts, what I have, what you might not, the, the, the person that asked the question does not yet have, I have hindsight. I mean, I'm like some, I mean, I've been able to think about this for decades, right? <laughs> And, and, you know, I've been able to kind which of... Which is why we're glad to have you, which is one of the reasons. No, I'm not, it allows you, in other words, to, 
to work through these experiences, uh, you know, over a period of time. And so to, to provide, it, you know, advice as to what you might do is follow your own, you know, impulses, basically. That's, you know, I, I mean, uh, if I learned anything, I mean, that's what I was doing, even though, even at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, um, without all of the context that you've provided and all of, and, and all of the, the work that you've done, you know, that can seem in some ways like a, you know, like a truism um, or, you know, it's, it's far from fortune cookie. But, but, you know, I really think when you, when you emphasize the hindsight, it's like how, how rare that is and how difficult that is. Like to, to have the wherewithal to do that. I mean, one can stumble through and figure things out, but to find the people and make the kinds of connections intellectually, socially, institutionally that allow you to then kind of further those so-called personal interests in a way that feels generative or feels productive is hard because there's so many different things about the nature of professionalization, about the nature of certain institutions, certain disciplinary requirements, et cetera, certain kind of politics of respectability that all kind of get in the way. They end up being kind of um, can kind of stifling that potentially. So I think that, that it's great advice um, and, you know, I hope that, that there's, there's a way for students to, to take that to heart and move forward. So the next question is from Teresa Wen, who says, Professor Heratunian, uh, what were some of your most enjoyable undergraduate courses um, Sorry, this, uh, uh, that you taught, especially at NYU? Teresa Wen, alumna, BA, NYU 2004, PhD, UMIS 2013. So some of your most en enjoyable undergraduate at courses. At NYU? At NYU, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't teach a lot of undergraduate courses, but I did teach one very large survey, which I really, really liked, uh, you know, with about 100 students. They, they, they call these core courses, which is interesting because a core course at the University of Chicago was, you know, about 25 students. This had about 100 or something. But it dealt with, uh, essentially, you know, problems in Japanese thought and culture or something like that. I forgot. And I really liked it. I liked it because it, it was, it, it gave me a, my teaching technique was all of it. Again, it's something that I learned from some of the best teachers I've ever had. This, this, I like moving around. I mean, I mean, doing this right now is really hard for me because I'm sitting down, you know, I mean, but I, my, 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 my whole body screams, in other words, you know, to, to get up and start walking around. And that, that course I was able to do. And, my, and that one says, because as a, as a teaching technique, it's an enjoyable one for me because no student is safe, in you know, other words, as a result. You're always, you're, you're always there. But the course itself was interesting. I like teaching, you know, it was a general, very general introductory course. And it was interesting to see how people, you know, you know, people for the first time being exposed to this kind of, 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 of thinking. I remember, and I, I did this at Chicago, too. And I, I also had a student who came up to me and told me that, he expected me to talk about his history, his history. And I said, I said, I said, I don't, whatever gave you that idea? I, you know, I mean, I, I mean, what is your history? I said, yeah. you know, no, right. Well, no, that's, that's helpful. I mean, um, well, but I think it, it does go back to, to something that you were talking about, you know, initially in terms of, of you know, I mean, these kind of classrooms and spaces where, uh, you know, there are students, I think about, you know, colleagues of mine, uh, one of whom seems to have asked a, a question, uh, this is Professor Jayanti Selinger, um, but Anne-Maria Shimabuku, who's your colleague at, at, at NYU as well, I mean, kind of, when, when you're teaching students who traditionally haven't necessarily been in Japanese <coughs> studies um, as, as constituted, you know, in that kind of immediate post-war era, so students, you know, we think kind of black, indigenous, people of color, kind of Asian-American, Japanese-American students who are not coming to Asian studies increasingly for, you know, to learn about, you know, because they're not getting that kind of, whatever they think they want in terms of learning more about, quote, their history um, is not available in, in public schools. I mean, it's, it's deemed too, kind of too specific. It's, it's kind of denigrated as being, as being research or whatever it is. And so they're, they're coming to sometimes the Asian Studies courses, the Japanese Studies courses, to learn about a kind of history that has been suppressed, you know, and, 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 and so, I think it, it does, it does, it can be a real awkward for professors. I felt this too, I mean, not just because of African-American teaching about you know, pre-modern Japan most of the time, but 
for what students are looking for and like having to frustrate them not to be mean, but as like as a matter of <laughs> some kind of pedagogical principle. It's like what you're looking for, you're not going to find regardless, but I still think that you should, you know, kind of study yeah. what you want to study. Right. That's, right. You know, Japanese incarceration is that comfort women and whatever that happens to be. But I think that that's an interesting thing that's, that's now because in some ways um, there's such you know, a, a, a you know it's a different kind of range of students that's, that's coming to these courses, partially out of refuge, right? Partially out of just kind of you know, kind of curiosity to kind of get rid of or kind of move past these suppressed narratives. But that's a different kind of uh, interpersonal I think challenge that, that some of us face. You know? Yeah, the point is, it seems to me, I think you touch upon it, but I, you know, I, I should emphasize is that. You know, as a historian, I'm all stay, I feel that, you know, you know, people all, I mean, history is the thing. Everybody knows history. I mean, swear to God, I mean, you know, and, you know, you find, you know, you, a good deal of what you're, what you're doing is really kind of giving them, in other words, you know, a perspective of really what history, you know, is. I mean, you know, what, you know, I mean, I, I always felt that so much of history is, 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 you know, is, 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 you know, conceals, as you point out. I mean, it conceals a lot of stuff. You know, stuff that people just never get around to. I mean, these these private attempts, in other words, to learn history. So that your job, and basically, is is, is is I don't want to use the term deconstructed. I mean, basically, you just want to give them a a perspective, at least a viable perspective or a logical perspective, in other words, that that really goes against the grain, actually, or at least some sort of. Conceptual grain. I mean, we get it all the time, I mean, and the way American, American people are always mouthing off about, you know, American history, you know, basically. And all of it is, it's, it's congratulatory stuff, basically. Right. Uh, to be, talk about history is not, it doesn't require, require you to be congratulatory. So. No, indeed, indeed, yeah. And, and I hope that, I mean, I said this last week, but, you know, it's hard to strike a balance because there's, there's you know, one wants to celebrate and, and congratulate and there's, there's things to do there, but to kind of maintain at the same time, to do that yeah. in a clear-eyed way, yeah. and in a worldly way is, is something we want to try to preserve. So we have a little bit more time and a couple questions. So this is a question from J.L.D. Selinger, um, who says, uh, uh, sorry to take you back to your earlier work. Your ideas in late Tokugawa culture and thought, uh, contrasting the, quote, culture of play with the play of culture, remain one of the important ways to think about how the literary, dramatic arts get politicized or depoliticized. Could you speak to the genesis of those ideas and the ways that you have revisited them in your later work? So particularly that tension between the culture of play and the play of culture. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where it came from, basically. Um, uh, because a lot of a lot of the work um, uh, emphasized a lot of a lot of the more received work, at least on late Tongala, uh, you know, culture really did you know emphasize, especially in the latter portions, like the 18th century and stuff, uh, is you know the the prominence of play, play, and uh, and I thought that yeah. Uh, it's, it's 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 not just a culture of play basically it's it is it's culture you know playing in many instances and that really required you know moving or trying to expand upon that initial insight or at least initial uh, uh, in, in, you know account of, of of cultural history in the late Tokugawa period which means you know getting into questions of you know, the you know the unit what is it what is the what is the unit in other words that you know that experiences culture uh, it becomes the body basically it's you know it's a it's a kind of coherent body for the first time you know that people begin to talk about and also illustrate but there are other forms in other words where we, I mean culture developed into it, it developed into you know it's not it was not just pleasure that's the interesting thing about it again. It was possibly, um, it was a way by which I could begin to think about, and I still do, I mean, in my, uh, uh, I could think about the relationship, the way culture is able, in other words, to Enter the body. produce or develop, you know, or, you know, or, or uh, 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 new uh, kinds of possibilities for politics, basically. 
And that's actually, uh, to answer the question as to well, how does that, that work in my current work, I mean, in my, my later work is that I went back, for example, uh, in this, this most recent book and kind of tried to cover some ground that I had started with initially, with, you know, dealing with, you know, the problem of the restoration and, you know, and how, how the restoration kind of came about, who was really involved and what, what was involved, basically. That was a book that I did, uh, uh, called, you know, uh, at, you know, toward restoration. But, and I was, uh, there's a lot of things that are wrong with that, you know, and part of it was I was, I was too dependent upon, you know, thinking about, uh, and, and using people like the great Marxian historian, and the point out that she's actually yet not wanting to go as, 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 as extreme as he had. In this book, at the same, what I've, what I've done is I've tried to show that, that maybe, you know, that, that, that culture really, uh, you know, one of the things that Japanese you know, themselves, historians, in other words, of that period, have not done is recognize the role of these cultural discourses that were developed, in other words, in the, from the late 18th into the early 19th century. And these, are, when I'm talking about cultural disc discourses, many of them are accompanied by movements. You can know, many of these, you know, like the new religions, like, you know, Tenrikyo, for example, things like that. These are discourses. These are initially discourses, and they're really, they're really critical discourses. They're critical about, you know, the moment in which they're being produced and against which they're being produced. And one of the things about restoration and historiography is that they're, they're, they're never counted. They're treated separately. And yet, it's their denial, and a really active denial, that makes the restoration look as if it was an inevitable event run, carried by, you know, loyalists and imperial loyalists. And it wasn't. It just simply wasn't, you know. So that's, that's basically... The, uh, to answer the question in, in, in briefly, that's basically the, the effect of that that earlier engagement work, the, the, the culture of play. That's great. Thank you so much. So we're we're at, technically at time, but I do want to. There's a, um, a student, a new, uh, Yuki Nakayama, has a question. Says, "Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, talk." And um, he's asked um, if, and if you could do this as, as succinctly as, as you as you might, Harry. Um, I'm curious if there are any newer or younger scholars that you're currently reading or have read recently that are doing what you find exciting and inspiring. I think that's in Japanese studies, or is this? I'm, I'm assuming in Japanese studies. Oh, I think yeah. that I think that you know, uh, it's not a student of mine, but he became kind of he came as I left Chicago. This is uh, yeah. the work by Katsuya Hirano, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, he wrote uh, this wonderful work on mm -hmm. like, Tokugawa mm -hmm. thought in literature, actually, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a book worth worth. I think it's 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 really a first class book. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that you know it's rare to find you know people that can work in that period and and you know say something really interesting. Uh, and as far as the modern period, I don't. And there's not a lot that I've seen you know that that has, that has grabbed my attention, but that was me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, sounds good to me. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Harry, for this really wonderful conversation. I've, I've learned a lot, um, and, you know, I think that um, I'm so excited that you get to be the, the first of our actual kind of guests to kick this this year off of, of kind of reflection, um, not pure uh, congratulatory, <laughs> you know, kind of, but something much more kind of critically oriented and um, expansive, hopefully, and exploratory as we, as we move through the year. Um, thank you so much for your time and all of your contributions to not just Japanese studies, but to kind of a broader, I think, ethic of, of, of teaching and learning and, and questioning that I think is really, I think is really impressive and, and, and really has been important for me and the people who've trained me, but then also I think for lots of folks who've been able to kind of join us today and we'll see this on the web and so forth too. So thank you so much for all of your work and, and, uh, yeah, I hope that you Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, you got yeah. it all wrong, Rezzy. I mean, this is a, this is, a, you know, and, and, and this is, this is a discussion, which means in other words, you know, it's between two people. Well, no, you know, of course. It depends, yeah. on who you're talk, it depends on who you're talking to, you know? I mean, right. sure. you're, you're, you know, so it's mm -hmm. a, you're an interlocutor. I mean, and, I, you know, they, 
I mean, I would, uh, you know, as I say, I mean, you know, I'd ask if they're the right kinds of questions. I mean, you know, I mean, that's basically what it comes out to. Uh, anyway, thanks very much. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for that, and thank you. And thank you to everyone that, that joined. Thank you so much to the CGF staff who helped to kind of organize this and work through rehearsals and everything, too. And yeah, please stay tuned. Uh, join us next week for, for Ryan uh, Saki uh, Yokota's yeah, well. presentation. And yeah, check it out. And, and um, thank you all uh, for, for joining us today, and please take care.